Good evening. My name is Charles Hoagland, and I'm a dramaturg for the Huntington Theatre Company. On behalf of the Huntington and of our partner on this conversation, conversation Teatro Chelsea, it's my pleasure to welcome you to tonight's discussion, Translation and Culture, Celebrating Sonia Sefue. Sonia Sefue is the Spanish language translation of Huntington artist in residence Melinda Lopez's landmark play, Sonia Flu. Sonia Flu premiered at the Huntington in 2004, and Teatro Chelsea will produce a virtual reading of Sonia Sefue, January 14th through 17th. To reserve a ticket, please visit www.teatrochelsea.com. Tonight, we feature a conversation between Melinda, Sonia Safeway director Armando Rivera, who is also the program director of Teatro Chelsea, and Professor Noe Montes, who is an experienced translator and the director of graduate studies at the Department of Theater, Dance, and Performance Studies at Tufts University. The conversation is moderated by Amelia Bensusen, artistic director of Hartford Stage, professor of theater at Emerson College, and director of many productions at the Huntington, including Melinda Lopez's translation and adaptation of Frederico Garcia Lorca's Yerma, which premiered at the Huntington in 2019. Before we begin, we'd like to acknowledge that our physical spaces stand on the occupied homeland of the Massachusetts people. We honor and respect the many native people who are connected to this land, past, present, and future, including the Dip Nipmuc and Wampanoag peoples. Our program this evening will be run as a webinar, meaning that those of you in the audience will not be visible to the panelists or to one another. However, we'd like to invite you to ask questions throughout the program using the Q&A function. You'll find a button at the bottom of your screen. All questions can be viewed by our panelists first and then will be made available to all attendees as they answer. And now it's my pleasure to welcome Melia Bensusen. Thank you so much, Charles. Bienvenidos. Que placer estar aquí con ustedes. So we'll, we'll be mostly working in English, but if you would like to speak to us in Spanish, we, uh, we're happy to answer questions that are posed in the Q&A um, in either Spanish or English. So uh, do feel comfortable in reaching out to us in either in either language. It's, it's truly an honor to be here with these great people. Um, a huge fan of the work that I know of the three of you, as well as um, just endlessly interested in the act of translation and how we share the works from one culture with another and what it means to, to shift from one language to another, the whole, the whole sense of what that means in terms of a work. So let me start then at, oh, and I will add, this is meant to be an informal conversation. So uh, please feel free, the three of you, to jump in at any time and we certainly can overlap in our conversation and clarify as we go through. So, por favor. Uh, so let me start with Armando because the reading of Sonia Fue is really the impetus for all of us gathering. And can you tell us about what inspired the creation of Teatro Chelsea and why was Sonia Fue a perfect project for you to work on both as an artist and as a company? Classic, I was muted. <laughs> yeah, yeah, but your best thoughts were shared. You know, that's that's the key about muting. Uh, so thank you, Amelia, uh, uh, and uh, thank you for everyone for being here. Uh, so just to start with Teatro Chelsea, Teatro Chelsea, and I'd be remiss if I didn't uh, mention the, the longstanding work uh, that the Apollinaire Theater, our, our parent company uh, in Chelsea, uh, have been doing for the last 20 years uh, in bilingual theater. Uh, but it's kind of the culmination of the work that Danielle has done with the Apollinaire Theater uh, in creating a space uh, for bilingual uh, community theater, uh, specifically focused on uh, the Latino population uh, of Chelsea and the Boston metro area uh, to have access to, to bilingual work. Um, because, uh, you know, I've been living in Boston for about six years, a little over six years now. And uh, I, I really will never forget the first day I walked in, uh, I, I took a bus, the 111 bus over to Chelsea. And uh, I'd been living in Boston for over uh, a year. And it was the first time I had walked the streets of any town in a long time where people were, were speaking to me in Spanish. And there were Spanish businesses and I was seeing and, and smelling all the things that I, that I, 
I didn't realize I had missed so much uh, from, you know, time in Puerto Rico or, or in Florida. And I'd never forgotten that feeling. Uh, and since that time, I realized that there was a community that I had not personally as an artist been accessing to. Um, and for the last five years, I've been working uh, with the Apollinaire Theater, uh, whether that be as an actor or as a uh, youth coordinator uh, for the Children's Theater Program, uh, working to, to find ways to, to, to bring that community into uh, the theater space. So Theatre Chelsea uh, is, uh, is to me the, the culmination of that work with a Creative Catalyst grant from um, Mass Development uh, and the TDI Foundation. Uh, we were able to, to concentrate uh, this past year on, on creating that work. Of course, none of us could have known that we'd be doing that in, in the era of COVID. Uh, so we've been, we've been faced with a very unique challenge of, of, uh, of trying to, to bring that theater to Latino audiences. Right. And where Sonia Sefue fits into that is uh, uh, the generosity of Melinda. I think Melinda was one of the first people when she found out about uh, the, the program and before we even had, had a name, she just knew that we were, we were out there. Uh, and she, she, she graciously said, I, I leave this to you and I offer it at, at your discretion. And um, on a personal level as an artist, uh, I've told this to a couple of people, but I just remember when I first moved to Boston, I was looking up playwrights and, and people and artists. And I was like, Melinda Lopez, she seems to be the, the Latina artist that I should, I should, I should aspire to, to, to get to know someday. So I was like, well, that, that, that checks off my bucket list of things to do in Boston. So uh, that was, that was a little personal uh, goal accomplished. You gotta, you gotta, you gotta work on that bucket list. I, I know, I know. <laughs> and now, now it's doing great. <laughs> I think we're doing just great on the bucket but list. But Sonia Sifue just seemed like uh, the the perfect embodiment of 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 Latinidad that, that that it means to me, which is, uh, and I've said this a million times, it's kind of my mantra, which is like the the, the bicultural nature uh, of a Latino in in the United States, is uh -huh. that we. We are we we may be born uh, in the, in the states or in my case I was born in Puerto Rico, uh, and we we are born into a citizenship into an identity that is American, but we have a heritage that at times is is duly opposed to that. Uh, and and in first part it's language. You have a language that is not the same as the one that you are are growing up in. Um, and I just think that Sonia Sefue embodies that completely. I mean, there's there's a, there's a duality. Uh, right. in its structure and in the duality of, uh, of Sonia as someone who has completely assimilated for her own reasons, uh, but always, always in the back and always in her heart is, is the identity uh, uh, of a Cuban heritage and, and, and bringing those two back together again. Um, that, just, that just resonates with me so wholeheartedly. I, I love what you're saying. It's that the theme and the structure and the reason for doing the play at this moment all, all connect. So thank you. Uh, Melinda, and forgive me, because I said Sonia Fue instead of Sonia Se Fue. So I realized I was <laughs> Se Fue, Se Fue. Um, it, I remember uh, being at uh, Sonia Flu. I had not been in Boston very long and was extraordinarily moved by the production and did, as, as you so beautifully put, Armando, felt seen, right? There's a way of like how we bury parts of ourselves. Um, I think most people have some sense of this, of a childhood and adulthood maybe being in different places. But I think if you've had the experience of having um, two different languages, it, 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 it shifts that even further. So I, I wonder, Melinda, what was it like for, what's it like for you to hear Sonia Se Fue, al, you know, Al Lugar de Sonia Flu? And I know you, you saw the translation at the Camagüey Festival, right, in Cuba. And so what's it like to hear the play and you're not the translator, which is, right? Which is interesting too. Um, and how does the language, how does hearing it in Spanish, what does it do to you? And how does the play speak to you now? Also, all these years after. Um, so is that there any part of that? So grab the, a piece. <laughs> the thing I'm thinking of also 
having heard Armando speak is that I'm, I'm realizing like, oh, the next time we have to do the first act in English and the second act in Spanish. Okay, that's that actually be the culmination. That's fabulous. Uh, right? Yeah. Uh, oh, yeah. So um, uh, thank you so much, Armando, for, um, for those kind words. Uh, I, um, I also would be remiss if I didn't acknowledge um, um, both uh, um, the support of uh, the Mellon Foundation. So I, I had the great good fortune to be um, a, a Mellon Foundation National Playwright Residency. So I was partnered with the Huntington Theater um, through the Mellon Foundation. And as part of um, your get, um, including you know, artistic support and you get health insurance and you get a bunch of great things, um, being a national playwright in, in residence, is I mean, you have some discretionary funds to spend to do things that you wouldn't normally you know, have access to. And one of the things, one of the very first things I wanted to do was translate Sonia, Sonia Flew and Becoming Cuba into Spanish. And I didn't, I didn't know why it mattered to me, um, but it was incredibly important to me. And so I just thought, well, I'll, I'll lead with that and I guess I'll figure out why later. And it was an interesting experience because I, I hired a translator. I knew I couldn't do the job. I hired a translator and the first series of translations that came in, I realized that the translation, translator had a, a, a background um, from Mexico. And I, I didn't know that about this translator and I love this translator, but it, it wasn't quite right. right. And, I, and there were moments where I was like, yeah. so this expression and this thing, and I don't think we use that word. And so there, there was a complicated negotiation with that first, um, uh, that first attempt. And I ended up, um, I paid them for their work and I thanked them profusely. And then I, I realized I had to be more selective and find uh, a Cuban, someone with Cuban heritage. And so, um, through a series of other connections, I was able to um, work with Alberto Sarrain, who ended up doing the translation. He is, you know, he's a he was a Cuban theater maker. Um, he left in the 80s, I believe. You know, he has a long track record of making theater in Cuba, long track record of making theater in Miami, and now he he does a little of both. He's back and forth to Cuba um, as much as is possible in the moment. So, so that was interesting. Right, we yeah. talk about Latinidad and you know, oh, Latinus and Latin. not a monopoly. And no, it was constantly a challenge to explain. Immediately yeah. clear, like rhythmically, even though my Spanish is not flawless, but I, I knew it was off. Yeah. And so um, when we talk about translating culture, there's something there that, you know, as an Iberian a, a person growing up with an Iberian culture is, is going to be different than a Caribbean culture, is going to be different than the specifics of, you know, that micro thing. Um, and so um, uh, it, it came to pass that um, through Alberto, I was able to connect with Lillian Mansour, who's um, who has created the Cuban Digital Theater Archive at the University of Miami. And, um, and I met Carlos Seldran, who runs the Argos Teatro in Cuba. And so I was able to hook up with, um, uh, virtually with a number of Cuban um, dramatists and somehow concocted a way to get myself to Cuba for this, um, for this festival. And um, a couple of things that were really interesting was, um, uh, we did the reading in, in originally, first we did the reading in Havana and then we brought it to come away, but the company, so Carlos Serdan cast it and um, Alberto Sarain directed it, but it was mostly Carlos's actors. And the woman who played Sonia um, had the exact same physical. So the original production, we had Carmen Roman, who was a tall, slender, People were like, "Oh, she looks like you." I don't think that was the idea. But Italian, right? Not a, yeah, not a not a bot not a body type. Right. And it was just so interesting that she he cast her in the same role, and she had that same like Bernard de Alba thing about like yeah. the precision and the strength, and also yeah. this, like cracking open. So it was great to see how the play in translation still retained 
what must yes. knit, yeah. knit into it somehow. Um, the other thing I'll say is that um, I, of course, I realized, I knew when I wrote the play, and this again goes to the question of culture, that I, part of my job as a dramatist was to um, create a universe where the, the rules of Cubanidad are clear to a non-Cuban audience. Um, and so things about like how that second act unravels, like what are the rules in Havana and how can I e explain it to an audience that doesn't come from that culture? Um, I was very conscious of laying in that second act in ways that would be accessible because I, I, had, I assumed that I wasn't going to have an, a Cuban audience. I, I, I just didn't think that that seemed feasible and I wrote with that in mind. But of course, when I got to Cuba, it was the first act that was inaccessible. So interesting. So yeah. how, how did that first act translate, you know, this sort of upper middle class Jewish um, um, family in the middle of, you know, the winter in Minneapolis, right. um, you know, people of privilege, et cetera. Um, so it's just really interesting to see how that dynamic changed in in c2 right when when right. i had a cuban audience watching it and of course the stuff in cuba they were like yeah yeah we already know all this stuff yeah yeah get on with it <laughs> i mean it's so interesting in terms of just all of our work as theater makers of knowing who our audience is and who we're writing for right. or who we're directing for or who we're producing for um thank you it's amazing noe you you're so experienced as a translator i i wonder what your thoughts are on this front. What are some of the things you seek to figure out when you're about to translate a play? So, so you know, uh, the the anecdote that Melinda shared about uh, initially hiring a translator who uh, was of a Mexican background right. and uh, realizing that the idioms weren't quite right uh, is a reminder that you know the act of translation is always a political act. It's always a cultural act, right. uh, and uh, you know, uh, we it's important. To, to, to you know, think about the idea of translation as sort of carrying across meaning from one culture to another. And the, the reasons for carrying across that meaning can be multiple. Um, the Brazilian playwright Osvaldo de Andrade, for example, talks about the act of translation as a type of like cannibalism where uh, he's taking, he writes about like uh, taking sort of plays from colonizers and sort of digesting them through the language of the colonized so that they make new meaning. Right. Um, and with uh, Sonia Flew or Sonia Sefue, uh, you know, uh, Melinda's right that this is a play that uh, explores a lot of different cultural identities, uh, an upper middle class family in the Midwest, uh, family with Cuban heritage, with Jewish heritage. Um, and some of that is going to resonate with some members of the audience uh, who share similar cultural backgrounds and experience. Some of it will be new to some members of the audience who don't have any of these experiences. And there's probably some small percentage of an audience for whom all of this will have some familiarity and resonance. And I think that the, the trick of the translator uh, is to try to, to, to uh, interpret the text in a way that gives, that, that makes the work equally accessible to people who are hearing the play in Spanish for the first time. But you know, I think theater is something that's particularly well suited to the act of translation because uh, theater is fundamentally an act of translation. Yeah, I've when, always said that too. I totally agree. Yeah, when an actor takes on a role and is interpreting a playwright's language, uh, it, hopefully in a way that is unique to their experiences and different from the actors who have come before, that itself is an act of translation. Right. Uh, same thing with the director developing a concept. Uh, and, uh, you know, I, I think uh, in the same way, the work of a translator taking play text from one language and moving it to another language is uh, 
part of the theatrical work of interpretation uh, right. that you know, is inherent to the, the craft that we're all involved in. So is every translation an adaptation to a certain degree? I mean, we're right. I mean, that sort of poses the question a bit and I'll thank you for that incredibly thoughtful answer. Melinda makes, it brings to my mind um, the extraordinary work you did on Yerma and how honored I was to work with you on that, but that that was a translation and then an adaptation because you went through stages with it from Iberian Spanish, right? From a very, you know, from Lorca into uh, a, a relatively contemporary American uh, vocabulary. Yeah. But you also then, I mean, yeah. we wrestled so much with the cultural right. challenges there. So right. how was it different for you to go from Spanish into English and from that classic work that's of a very certain time um, versus your experience on Sonia Se Fue? Um, so I... I I, I don't think this is my idea. I think I'm drawing from the work um, of Rosanna Warren, who was my uh, professor at Boston University. I studied translation under her. Um, and uh, uh, but, I, but I also think of the act of translation as, as sort of an act of violence to a text, right? It's it, it, uh, the, it, the interpretation or the reinterpretation involves some like wrestling and tearing open and you know trying to get to the heart of something. Um, um, which is a, a violent and transgressive thing to do, to say, I am the one to put meaning right. in this, right? A certain um, meaning, right? I'm, I'm determining the interpretation by translation. Right. And, and, um, uh, uh, um, and then this question of, are you, are you just, are you translating the meaning um, and, and working to maintain the strangeness say of that play from the 30s or that play from the 17th century, or are you trying to make it accessible in a way that doesn't feel strange? And right. both of those are, are both of those are gonna be doomed to some kind of failure. Like you're never gonna actually succeed at either one of those. But, but my interest in Yerma um, um, uh, was that I had never, I hadn't really come across a, a translation of that play that I thought was playable. Um, and that it felt to me that the that the translations had been overly precise and overly um, dogmatic to Lorca's um, uh, uh, poetry and 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 overly respectful is what I mean that it, they didn't allow an actor to um, play and so one of my intentions was to crack open the play so actors could get in and 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 mess about with it. But I was also really interested in leaving the play strange. It's a, it's a strange play. It, it has a number of different stylistic events. It, it moves, as we talked about so much, Amelia, like sort of moves in and out of different kinds of realities. Right. And so I, I didn't want to go in and fix the play or make it accessible to a, a, a Huntington audience or a, or a, or a What's the other theater? What's the theater? ACT, ACT, <laughs> San Francisco. Is that what you're going? Yes. You've blocked that, but that's okay. I, we'll, I blocked we'll, we'll... it out. I blocked it out. So I didn't. I I wanted to keep it difficult, and so you where I like cultural. Where, yeah. So where I kind of tried, I, I and I don't know that I succeeded. There were some choices that I made, and I tried to stick to them. But where I where I where I where I went for the access was. Um, um, uh, blowing up the characters a little bit, trying to make the characters a little more three-dimensional, which is what I think a contemporary American audience, that's what they gravitate and, towards. And, but but using the strangeness of the play in place, if that makes sense. Is this sense. when it goes into adaptation versus translation? I mean, just do we wrestle with that question here? Well, because when no. yes, we say is a translation. Yeah. Yeah, um, you know, I think an adaptation of, of Yerma is the is the the new Vic production, right? Where it's they set it on the upper, they set it in Soho or the Upper West Side, um, um, with a uh, you know a woman who's desperate to have a child and 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 
kills her husband or herself. Um, and it's, she, and it's yeah, yeah. She didn't, she didn't kill herself. She killed her husband. Not that I'm bitter about that choice or anything on that adaptation. But, uh, but, uh, but I, I, I knew that I was not interested in doing a contemporary, uh, that I was not interested in doing that. Right. And so then the question is, you know, where are we? What's the culture? And what you and I talked about was the familiarity of many um, uh, uh, Latino cultures, whether they're in the um, farming communities of Mexico or the farming communities of Central California, where you have um, uh, dirt roads, but people with cell phones, and you have you know people working the land with their hands. But you, but they're also wearing, um, you know, carrying the plastic, colorful plastic bags, and so that, so that the, it, it, there are places in the world where you feel like all the timelines are aligning, right? And so for me, I never had any trouble knowing where and when I was, and I felt like the pushback that I got from some producers of like, is is it old? Is it new? We don't know. I felt like that was a kind of Suprem white supremacist attitude about um, um, you know how the world operates. Um, so, yeah, yeah, no, that's wonderful. And so uh, uh, Armando Noé, I mean, I think that there is something about work in Spanish in this country that has really suffered under um, the colonialism, in a sense, of the the Anglo view. Right. Uh, right, that it's still somehow, it seemed to me that part of why Lorca is not known and Calderón de la Barca is not known and, and, and Lope de Vega, et cetera, et cetera, no? Is that there's, um, we know Moliere, we know Shakespeare. So what is it about Spanish language works at this moment or historically in the United States? What, Noe, what do you think? Yeah, so, so uh, you know, a couple of things, uh, one, uh, for the better part of the past century, uh, English, because of U.S. and British colonialism, has become the sort of uh, dominant language in global politics and in like, global economic exchange. Uh, and so, uh, as a result, as a like, simple matter of fact, like, uh, there are more work Trans, there's more work translated from English into other languages than there is work translated from other languages into English. And uh, you know, I think part of that is part of a sort of legacy of, uh, like just part of legacies and histories of uh, colonialism. Uh, you know, I, I wanna jump back also to some of the things that Melinda was saying earlier like uh, there's a, a tendency in the theater to uh, want to uh, imagine translation as this sort of act of faithful interpretation or faithful recreation. Right. Like the translator's job is to somehow take the playwright's words in one language and uh, make uh, an, as, an, an exact, carbon copy as possible in the language that they're interpreting into. And that's an impossible act for starters, but also a fundamentally unfair uh, sort of uh, burden to place on the work of the translator. Uh, again, thinking about the sort of uh, cultural work that is involved with translation. Uh, so, you know, I, I think uh, it is just a, a, you know, reckoning with the sort of colonial histories of the U.S. and Western Europe, particularly the United Kingdom, and uh, you know, trying to create room for more voices and a richer uh, dramatic ca right. literature canon through the act of translation of works from Spanish and other languages into uh, English. Exactly. It's so, um, uh, Maria Delgado, right? An extraordinary translator and critic as yeah. well, talks a lot about how more people speak English as a second language uh, 
than of any other second language, but there are more people speaking Spanish as a first language than English as a first language. Right? I think it's a fascinating that's thing. Right. Yeah, that's great. Of, right? In terms of yeah. culture and works. Um, also, I mean, in my experience working, again, to sort of hail the greats of Puerto Rican traveling theater and repertorio español and starting out working in bilingual theater, Armando, I know that for me, my experience directing actors in Spanish versus directing actors in English <laughs> was completely different. I mean, it was really, really interesting. I mean, both I felt some someone else come through me when I worked in Spanish. Um, but also seeing both of those theaters did performances of plays I directed in Spanish and in English, right? It would alternate. It was fascinating. And I just wonder about your experience with Teatro Chelsea and and what it's like. And are you aiming to do it in both languages eventually? we a, a lot of us, there was a comment in the chat. We love this idea of Sonia se fue el primer acto en inglés, el segundo acto en castellano. Me parece divino, no? We <laughs> Really do first in English, second in yeah. Spanish. But yeah, I think I think that's yes, that's uh, I think that's uh, that, that that is not the first time it's been brought up. It was like oh, this oh. is obvious, uh, and uh, <laughs> but for me, I think <laughs> you know, I, I, but, I, but you know, you have to, you have to use some of that bilingual mindset. Yeah. Uh, but I think for me, what was the, the challenge for me is that uh, I would say that yes. Yeah, we're gonna have it with subtitles. <laughs> yes. We are, we well, are gonna have it with subtitles. Can we also like hold on to this notion of, um, and, and come back to you, Armando, but I'd really like to explore what it means to understand every word on stage versus to watch a play. Oh, I can, I can speak, I, I would love to speak but to this. I, I would love to have that conversation, but first talk about the actors, yeah. Yeah, the actors, I mean, like for me, uh, I, I would personally not have described myself as a fully fl fluent Spanish person. My mother is, is in the audience right now and she knows <laughs> like many uh, first language Spanish brothers, she told me many times in my youth that I should practica todo español and I didn't do it. Um, and I'm doing it, I'm making up for that time now. Uh, and what is rich to me and what is what is so rewarding is is the generosity of the cast uh, and the understanding that we, we uh, they, I, I ask for their forgiveness all the times so when sometimes I have to just switch because I can't, I don't have the words just it's yet, Spanglish. but I receive it. Right. I, I, it's Spanglish all day. All day. There's um, a fluency in Spanglish <laughs> that we all share at this point in our lives. Uh, pero uh, what, I, what I know uh, is, 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 is to receive it that way. Like uh, there's fluency in understanding. I, I, I don't, I, I, I understand completely what is, what is being said to me. That has been trained to me my entire life. Uh, my tongue just doesn't want to what fights me on 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 speed returning that 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 favor uh, but what, what it has been a joy for me is is I'll, I'll come out of rehearsal and I know it's working I know that I, that, that 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 it's coming back to me because I'll end a rehearsal and I go Ay, Dios mio. like <laughs> <laughs> and I know that I'm still there I'm I I I, I, I there's a there's the switch that happens and 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 you know the goal for me has always been to to maintain that and I know that for me, I'm not alone in that experience. I know that some of my cast feels that, or maybe maybe one leaning one way towards the other. Right. And there's this uh, pure empathy for for the the the, the truth of our, our existence, living a, a bilingual life, and that you know we 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 constantly switch back and forth in our homes uh, all day uh, in our childhood and our in our adulthood when we call our our family and uh, in whatever respective country of our origin. Uh, it happens all the time, uh, and, uh, and it's been a joy for me to to kind of be in the 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 best Spanish class I've ever taken. <laughs> I, I was here in in 1989, I think. I think I've told you this, Melinda. No, I was part of El Primer Taller Internacional de Teatro in La Habana, Cuba. Oh, I remember. Yes, right. And it was theater makers from all over Latin America, mm -hmm. and. And it was fascinating how many different languages were spoken <laughs> with everyone speaking Spanish. Right. And then, you know, the, the, the sort of sense of being immersed in this language. And um, it's just very moving to really yeah. be surrounded by all the different voices. And Armando, as you're saying, I mean, it's everyone's bringing their culture into how they're articulating their, their thoughts as well. well. One of the things I 
I think, Noah, you can probably speak to this, um, is that I find exciting about the work that's getting um, created now is how much it's drawing from indigenous languages, um, um, yes. especially the, the Mexican American and, um, you know, um, Chicano, uh, Chicano plays, Luis Alfaro and, and lots of other playwrights who are, who are really- um, Octavio uh, Feliz también. Yeah. No? That um, it's bringing, bringing the, um, uh, that culture onto the stage as well. Yeah, and you know, that's something that on some level dates back to like the work of El Teatro Campesino in- Totally, the, and Zoot Suit. For sure, uh, but uh, you know, I, I think partially because places like uh, the public theater or the Huntington are uh, making more of an effort to uh, stage plays from uh, people whose work fits in like the Hispanic or uh, uh, Latin American diaspora. Uh, we're getting a chance to see more of that. I also think that there are increasingly growing like really good virtual spaces. Uh, I think about the uh, Hemispheric Institute, which is run by New York University. Uh, that's essentially a, uh, a repository uh, for uh, filmed productions and interviews with theater artists that we get a chance to, to, to learn more about the cultural contexts of the, the plays that are being produced. Uh, you know, Lillian Mansour's uh, Cuban uh, database project uh, down in Miami is another example of this. Right. Mm -hmm. And there's the, the UCLA, you know, diversifying the classics where they're really trying to do a lot of translations of golden age plays, for yeah. example, that have been unknown previously. Um, there's a great question in the chat. Thank you, Roxanne. So we'll come right to that. I just, before we come to that, can we talk a little bit about American audiences, however we define American, and the, the challenge of language in our theaters? I mean, I know uh, at Hartford Stage, this is a big question for us, right? Because uh, really one of our initiatives now is to do far more Latinx work. Hartford is 48% Latinx. And one of the, you know, we have audiences who are worried they won't understand every word, right? Yeah. Which is not necessarily a question in other countries. We're, we're kind of spoiled in, the, in the, the dominance of English, right? Yeah. So what do you all think about that? What are your thoughts around, I, I'm thinking of the question about subtitles. If there are words you don't understand in a play, right? No one understands all of Shakespeare. Yeah, I mean this this, this is the this is the penultimate example. Okay. But but I something uh, that's come to mind for me, and I'd love to you know pose the question right back is like I think there is an inherent value in the in in an alienation effect. Like there are things that cannot be translated. Just to, to, to bring it back to Sonia Sifwe, there there is a there is a dinner scene and there is a yep. there is the prayer for the Shabbat. Right. And you know, there there might be there might be a a, a desire or a, a knee-jerk reaction to want to translate that. But that is that is something that is inherently cultural. And 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 it cannot be trans I mean it can be translated, but the act of not translating it exposes you to a different culture. It, it, it tells you that I am witnessing right. something that is beyond my, my, my scope and my, my understanding. And then you have to, then it, then it becomes the challenge beyond the subtitles, which is, which is ritual and DNA. M uh, Melinda and I have talked a lot about how uh, the, there, is, there, is some, there is some magical link between, or an attraction between the Cuban culture and the, the Jewish culture. And, 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 and it can't be explained. It can't be explained, there's an attraction to it, but I think there's something uh, to be said about ritual and that's in our DNA. Um, and uh, for me, that was, uh, it, it could be as simple as example. Uh, when I went, uh, when I saw a, a cafe teatro play in Puerto Rico and they had, I think they were doing La, La, La Señora de las Nubes. And they were doing, they had done some adaptation and they had changed some, some songs to be Puerto Rican folk songs. And it was in a complete alienation effect to me because I had primarily grown up in, in 
in the United States. And I didn't know these folk songs. But someone who I'd never seen be passionate about theater I did, which was my dad, he was singing those folk songs with them. And so he had a moment of connection. And then in that moment, in that moment of alienation, I felt a longing to be part of, right. of a culture. Uh, and, and, and to bear witness, I think is really valuable uh, as far as like, what is the value of that? What is the value of subtitles and translation? I think there's value in alienation too, because we, we get that with Shakespeare all the time and we do just fine. <laughs> I, I love the uh, comment in the chat, right? That sometimes to translate things literally is to break the spell in some way. So I think that that is a, a wonderful way to put it, that we, we are there to receive, to observe, to take in, to long for in some way. No, I, what were you going to say? I'm sorry. Yeah, no. Uh, the other thing I, that I think is worth noting is that theater is a visual medium, fundamentally. Uh, language and text plays a great role in the theater. And I don't want to discount the work of playwrights, uh, the work of actors delivering language, uh, but uh, theater is a visual medium, and part of the way that meaning is communicated is just through the act of watching. And so I I sometimes, when I go to plays that are in, not in English or in Spanish, which are the languages I have, try to tune out the subtitles to see, uh, or super titles, to, to see how much I can pick up otherwise. And for English-speaking audiences, like, it's, it, we don't go to see dance and expect to, like, have the meaning made literal. Right. Well, we understand that there's it's an act of It's interesting how, how slavish we can be to vocabulary, to a literalness of language in the theater. Yeah, uh, you know, it's it's almost the equivalent of someone who goes to like uh, the an art museum and only reads Leave the records alongside right, right. Yeah. Right. or right. opera. I mean, at. we're much more expansive about um, about embracing opera in a variety of languages than we are theater. And, and again, I, I think it's a very American thing. I, well, I, but it's, yeah, I was gonna say, um, 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 English speakers are not um, used to being othered in this country. That's right. And, and, um, and it actually, um, as we've seen um, over the last several years, how provocative that has become um, um, even right, hearing, political. even right. hearing foreign language now in, um, you know, I mean, there was a, a what was it Montana where, a, um, a mother and daughter were, or, you know, they had the police called on them because they were speaking Spanish and, and, uh, someone, you know, thought that they shouldn't be there. So, um, um, the experience of feeling, um, a, a loss of control that comes with a loss of understanding right. is, is very triggering and challenging for um, many American uh, theater audience, many American audiences. Right. I think, I don't know about theater audiences. Uh, and, and, and it's interesting how um, um, it feels very tied to this moment and this conversation about social justice and what cultures are, we, what languages are we centering? What conversations right. are we centering? Um, uh, uh, so maybe worth pursuing. Um, it's really interesting, yeah. right? And and I I will read out part of um, Roxanne. Thank you for this question because it ties right in, right? Which is on the theme of uh, Spanish on stage as a political act, particularly in this country at this time, and I and also in Boston. How is Spanish language theater and particularly Sonia Se Fue being received and valued in Chelsea and the greater Boston area right now? Really, it, it's really speaking directly to what you're saying, Melinda and Noe, right? That it, it's basically, it's a, is it, it's basically a political act to do bilingual work in this country at this well, time? But I'll just jump in. I mean, you know, Armando, what I heard you say is it's an act of love. Like for you, I mean, it, starting this theater for you, what I heard you express was that it was an act of deep love for, yeah. The, yeah. Okay. So yeah, I hundred yeah, percent. I mean, I, I think, yes. I mean, like, yes, yeah. everything. I mean, like they're not mutually exclusive. Of no, I mean, I think everything we do and, and, and by, by nature living in America in this time, like speaking a second language is, is suddenly a political statement. <laughs> the, the validity of that, I don't know, but uh, for me, it's uh, what is the effect of that on on the city of Chelsea? I think uh, it's 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 opening the door. 
it's it, it is uh you know i think there's something to be said uh yeah, you know, the, the the building that the Apollinaire is housed in is the Chelsea Theater Works building, and it says Chelsea Theater Works on the front of it. And there, there's something to be said about just the, the the language of a sign that's that 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 can sometimes that can sometimes read, um, you know, this is a place for you, and this is not a place for you. But when you hear your language, when when in October we did a a series of storefront performances uh, to to try to to try to do bring back live performances, we 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 performed a bilingual vignettes behind storefront windows and what inherently happens when someone hears through a speakerphone their language being being spoken they suddenly go well what's that uh, and then they walk forward and then they look at the building and then they suddenly then they suddenly translate it and they go oh this is a theater building <laughs> and it's like oh but you guys do spanish and it's that it's like that's the that's the immediate effect and like that's that's seeing posters uh uh in downtown in the city of chelsea seeing emails and and seeing Okay, it's that's in Spanish. Being, right? It's, it's you're being it, counted. You're being counted. You're being considered. You're part of the conversation. It's not and, a small thing. Yeah, and then expanding on that, how does that affect Boston? I think for me, the the second layer is the 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 Latino art, artist. Um, it's it, you know, I, I I this is not a sole experience, but like you you don't realize how much you're searching for Latino for for Spanish work or bilingual work or Latino work until you realize like how little of it is is actually available to you at times. Mm -hmm. Um, and so we're, we've seen a great outpouring of passion from Latino artists going, I'm, I'm in like, like, you know, maybe I can't do this one, but I'm in, uh, because they want, they, we, we're looking for that hub. Um, and, uh, I think that's, that's the inherent value of, of Sonia Sefue is that we're, you know, we're bringing in local and national, uh, 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 uh talent, uh, that we, we search for and it, it's bringing us all together. And, and I mean, there's one thing that came out of this pandemic, it's, it's, uh, for theater is is that it's it's expanded our networks exponentially, um, and I'm I'm super excited about that. Uh, there's there's the microcosm and there's like the greater the greater effect that right. Sony Sibwa has. I also want to do a shout out, Melinda, just in terms of the little bit you and I tasted about what it sounded like to do bodas de sangre in Spanglish. Yes, that's right. To just to to actually right. embrace this moment. And understand that there's a lack, if right. you'll forgive the phrase, a lack of purity of a language. And and Armando, I, I'm so moved by your description, right? I mean, my son would say the opposite, right? That his mother let him down because I'm fluent in Spanish and and I didn't speak to him enough. So Melinda, probably I'm guessing there's a similar conversation at your house. <laughs> <laughs> One of our many failures, but yeah. But if we embrace these new languages, I don't, I, I'm a, on a bit of a tangent now, but hearing you speak, Armando, I'm really thinking, and this notion of if Sonia se fue en dos idiomas and how we could really, you know, and Noe, do you know of work? I mean, Octavio Solis plays with this a lot, right? Just being more familiar and with, with really merging the two languages in a, in a work. Yeah. Um... Off the top of my head, uh, I'm not coming up with other examples of playwrights who are sort of uh, merge. But, but uh, well, again, you can go back to El Teatro Campesino right. dating back to the 60s. Uh, uh, and, you know, I, I suspect that knowing some of the people who are participants in this conversation who are watching, uh, they could pr probably off the top of their head come up with even more names that we could collectively brainstorm together. Um, what, what, what struck me though, as I've been listening to Melinda and Armando talk is, uh, you know, we, we do live in a time where uh, people of uh, particularly Mexican, but uh, uh, of a variety of Latin American uh, backgrounds and heritages are, are uh, being uh, degraded and punished uh, for uh, speaking Spanish for, or for fundamentally for just being uh, people of uh, the diaspora living in the United States. Uh, so, uh, to to create theater that is bound in an act of love for the Spanish language, that's bound in an act of love for celebrating uh, Cuban culture or other cultures of the diaspora, like that is a political act. It's important to say to ourselves that we we see each other, 
that we have value and that the stories that we're telling uh, are worthy of celebration, uh, worthy of being shared with audiences across the city and across the United States. And audiences that don't come from the same background. Absolutely. That, that it's not a folkloric art form, that it's not, um, forgive the use of the phrase here, but it's not a shtetl form. <laughs> it's, <laughs> Right, that it's meant to be shared widely. Sorry, Melinda. Yeah. No, I'll also add. Um, I think in the um, in in the specific is the universal. Um, it's a it's a hackneyed expression, ha hackneyed thing to say, but um, um, you know the specifics of death of a salesman make it possible to enter that play. Right. This you know, a, a, and I think that any any plays that um, uh, you know written from um, authentic experience and how they are communicated. Um, so, you know, my experience with Sonia Flew is, as you were, you know, starting out, there's lot, plenty of people in the audience that don't come from that background or that experience, but something about the specificity in the writing and the, um, you know, the ex specific experience of, of losing your country or the specific experience of being torn from your family, um, um, is 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 universally universally translates to an audience and that's also i think the capacity that art right can take is 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 uh take the chaos of our lives and put a form to it um and um and 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 the language is one method of communication um but it's also a compilation of big universe big archetypes and 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 human experience um and so uh, this question of translating culture and you know what you what you keep and what you lose and what you sacrifice but what you hang on to it's just a very interesting it's very very interesting um uh, uh the, the the job of that translator um to to to, to not get general right in trying right. to communicate to like not so lose smart. the grit uh, those those words that are untranslatable or those, you know, the cooking, the food, the actions, whatever it's that is. So good what you're saying. Right. It makes me think of another question for all of you. And I know we're almost at time. So I'll just throw it out to the to the three of you in experience of this is how much should the translator and the playwright be in touch given a living playwright? So Melinda, how much were you in touch on the translation? Um, oh, Sonia, this way. Yeah. Right? Vodka, we tried calling him. He never answered our call. <laughs> single text. Um, uh, um, uh, 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 Alberto was amazing. He he took the play. He wrote the translation. He sent it to me. I gave the few tweaks, questions, yeah. notes, things of like, and you know, but it was uh, that was it was very much a handing over, and um, and he actually made some big choices. Like uh -huh. he, he didn't, he didn't. Um, Tell us one of them. Um, he cut a whole scene because well, he was like, that, you know what? I don't. That's I don't, huge. So, um, but it did, but it works. I mean, it's <laughs> fine. And, and there were things in his intelligence. He said, you know, a Cuban audience is not going to understand this. He changed names. For example, you know, the, there were some um, American names that just weren't going to translate. And so, right. um, so things like that. He was very, um, he was very um, uh, empowered, but it was also such a gift to be able to say like, yes, take it. And it was- so That's a lot your generosity too. I mean, Noe, have you been, you've been in situations, I think with both living and dead playwrights. Yeah, uh, so uh, I'm working on a collection of uh, translated plays by the Argentine playwright Santiago Losa right now that'll be out and available in uh, fall of next year, uh, fall of this year. Um, uh, it's all but, one year. COVID has just wiped out the years. It's like, yeah. who knows what year. Um, but he uh, expressed a real interest in you know, wanting to see the translations and to maybe offer some questions or comments. Uh, but I think he also ultimately understood that uh, this translation, which is being produced uh, for uh, US audiences reading the work in English who may not be able to understand it otherwise, like uh, there, there were certain uh, liberties that we necessarily had to take with the text in order to, to make it accessible. And uh, he, he, he understood that. I, I suspect that 
every playwright will feel some, you know, it's a continuum. Something on that spectrum. Yeah, something on that spectrum. Uh, but, you know, the, the, the experiences I've had so far have been pretty positive. Well, um, I, I wish we weren't at time. I feel like uh, what I'd really like is una botella de vino tinto and we'd all sit and <laughs> talking and drink some red wine. I but, just want to give a shout uh, out to, I see Lillian is uh, out in the audience. Hello, Lillian. And then there's a, um, a uh, Que Pasa USA, which is a show yeah, yeah, I grew up yeah. watching. I love that show, which is and the a, And a huge bilingual. thanks to Charles Howland for his prep for all of us and putting us together. Uh, but really an enormous thanks to the three of you for making this really an exciting conversation and just increasing, whetting my appetite. I can't wait to see Sonia yeah. Sefue. Do visit all of you with us. Visit teatrochelsea.com to reserve a ticket. And just very excited about all the possibilities. It's, it's something exciting about our country at this time. Yeah is to look forward to more and more of this kind of work. So, mil thank gracias. Thank you, Milia. Oh. Tremenda traductora you are, ah, too. No, Muchas gracias. Millones de gracias. Gracias a ustedes. This was really, really, really a pleasure. Thank you, Huntington. Thank you, Teatro Chelsea. And, and here's to Sonia Se Fue. Hasta muy pronto. Good night. Bye -bye. Gracias. Buenas noches a todos. Oh. Buenas noches. Buenas noches. <laughs>